and welcome to American Catholic History, brought to you by the support of listeners like you. If you value this content and wish to see it continue, become a supporter at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. We start once again with a word of thanks to our supporters, especially Quata Kids, Beth T, Steve K, Les R, Dennis S, David W, Christy W, Frank R, and Greg B. Thank you all. Yes, your support makes this podcast possible, and we continue to ask for more support. We're only about 20% of the way to the amount of support we need to really make this podcast a sustainable project. So if you've enjoyed these episodes, if you've learned something, if you've been inspired or edified or helped in your faith, please consider becoming a supporter. You can learn about our support tiers at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. The lowest is just $5 each month. Just $5. But for more each month, you'll get extra perks. So that said, and thank you for your support, on with the show. Today we're talking about John Henry Holiday, better known to history as Doc Holiday. He's another surprising Catholic who was a deathbed conversion. Yes, and not much in his life prior to his deathbed conversion would have suggested such an ending. But two things. One, he did have a beloved cousin who became a nun. And two, one doesn't have to be Catholic for a long time to be Catholic. Something about workers in the vineyard comes to mind. Yes, you're referring to the parable told at the opening of Matthew chapter 20. Yes, Jesus tells about a vineyard owner who hires men to work in his vineyard early in the morning, and then again four other later times throughout the day, and then at the end of the day he paid all of them the wage for a full day's work, even those who had only worked about one hour. Right, it's a parable that shows God's desire to welcome into his kingdom even those who only came to him at the last second. Yes. Yes, indeed. So if Doc Holliday really did come into the church and make a good confession shortly before his death, he's got a good chance of at least being in purgatory right now. Which is not a place we usually think about when we think about Doc Holliday. No, for one, it's easy to think of him as just a fictional character. He's almost a mythical Western persona associated with Wyatt Earp and the shootout at the OK Corral. He's been depicted often in movies and TV shows, but the only depiction that was almost entirely as the good guy was the awesome 1993 film Tombstone. Val Kilmer was really good in that movie. It was a fantastic film. The other reason it can be tough to think of him as one who is on his way to heaven, if not already there, is because he didn't exactly lead an exemplary life. Uh, no. He had a mistress, he was a famous gambler and a gunslinger, he was involved in his fair share of the rough and tumble of the Wild West. But he also had a very soft spot for his cousin Martha Ann Holiday, and it seems his love for her may have been his saving grace. Ultimately, yes, and their affection may even be memorialized in one of the greatest films of all time, Gone with the Wind. <laughs> And with all that as buildup, let's actually tell the story of Doc Holliday. Yeah, I'm your Huckleberry. You knew that was coming. I knew that was going to be that. <laughs> right John there. Henry Holliday was born on August 14th, 1851 in Griffin, Georgia. He was the son of a Presbyterian father and a Methodist mother. His mother adopted her husband's Presbyterian faith for a time, and John Henry was baptized Presbyterian, but his mother eventually returned to Methodism because she could not accept the doctrine of predestination. One of John Henry's closest companions in his childhood was his older cousin, Martha Ann Holliday. Martha Ann's father, Robert, and John Henry's father, Henry, were brothers. Maddie, as she was known, was 18 months older than John Henry, but they became close as children. As teens, they were near courtship, but the romance didn't fully blossom. In 1864, John Henry's family moved to near Valdosta, Georgia, way down near the Florida-Georgia line. That's a good name for a band. It sure is. Yeah. Anyway, Martha Ann's family also moved to the Holiday Farm near Valdosta to avoid the ravages of the Civil War. So the cousins were even closer than they had been when they lived further north in Georgia. One reason the romance may have been impossible was Maddie's faith. In contrast to John Henry's seriously Protestant upbringing, Maddie was raised devoutly Catholic. Her mother was a Fitzgerald, Irish Catholic. Any Presbyterianism that her father retained did not dominate. Also, cousins. Even if the families were okay with their children marrying across faith lines, the Catholic faith wouldn't allow first cousins to marry. This little fact will come up again later in our story, so hang on to it. 
Through his teens, John Henry attended the Valdosta Institute and received an excellent education, studying all the classic liberal arts, as well as Latin and ancient Greek. So, the exchange in Tombstone, when Holiday meets Johnny Ringo, wasn't contrived. He very likely could have conversed in Latin. When John Henry was just 15 in 1866, his mother died of tuberculosis. John Henry had helped nurse her and... Spoiler alert, this appears to be when he contracted the infection himself. At 19 years old, he went to Philadelphia, where he studied to become a dentist, receiving his Doctor of Dental Surgery degree at 20 years old. He worked as a dentist in St. Louis and then in Atlanta, Georgia, but it wasn't long before he received the bad news. He himself had tuberculosis. The diagnosis was grim. He only had months to live. The only hope was if he moved to a drier climate. And that meant moving west. Western Texas, Arizona, and Colorado provided a dry climate and much, much more. So in 1873, at 22 years old, he traveled to Dallas, which was then considered the last civilized city before the West began. But throughout this time of separation, John Henry, he wasn't yet known as Doc, and Maddie kept up a correspondence. They remained very close, despite physical distance. After going west, John Henry's health did stabilize. His symptoms didn't completely go away, but he didn't die in mere months. An uncle of his had a dentistry practice in Dallas, and he worked with his uncle. Together, they did some great work. He was really skilled at dentistry, and he even won some awards that first year. But sudden and uncontrollable coughing fits at very inopportune moments drove patients away, and his practice dwindled. But not before he picked up the nickname Doc Holiday. Eventually, he realized he had some skill as a gambler, to the extent that he had a better chance of making a living as a gambler than he did as a dentist. So he abandoned dentistry and became a professional gambler. He also was a very good shot with a pistol, and he was a quick draw. His gambling successes and some run-ins with the law, including some illegal gambling and a couple of shootouts, compelled him to move around a bit. Colorado, Wyoming, South Dakota, Kansas, then back to Texas. And this time in Texas, he met the other woman in his life. This was Mary Catherine Horoni. She was a woman of, well, multiple professions. She actually was a highly educated woman and apparently could have had a serious career all her own, but she wanted her freedom. Well, Holiday found someone he could stay with, at least for a time here and there, and she became his mistress. She was the only woman with whom he was known to have had any serious relationship out west. So here we have a man who grew up with an excellent education, who had a good and virtuous childhood sweetheart, and who went to school to be a dentist. But he ends up a gunslinging, drinking gambler with a mistress and tuberculosis. Sounds like an epic person for a film. Oh, <laughs> pretty much. All we need is the Earp brothers. And here they come. He met the Earps in 1877. Wyatt Earp, who was a lawman by this point, was in pursuit of an outlaw. In one town, a saloon keeper said that the outlaw in question had been there, and the gambler known as Doc Holliday had been playing cards with the outlaw, so Holliday might have some information. Holliday was willing to provide some information about that outlaw's plans, and the Earps were able to run him down. After that, Holliday and the Earp brothers met up a few more times before becoming partners in, well, anti-crime, crime, and a few events that were kind of in between the two. And so without getting into all the details of all the escapades that you can see dramatized in movies, Doc Holliday had a fair number of other adventures. He and the Earp brothers became good friends. He aided them in the pursuit of justice in both official and unofficial capacities, and that included the famous shootout at the OK Corral in the town of Tombstone, way down in southern Arizona in 1881. He's only known to have actually killed a couple of people, and those were justifiable either in pursuit of his official duties as a deputy U.S. Marshal or in self-defense. But the justice system isn't always impartial, especially in the Wild West of the late 1800s. So he found himself arrested, tried, acquitted, charged again, and eventually fleeing from the law on more than one occasion. His final flight came in 1882 when a warrant was issued for his arrest in Arizona. One of the outlaws that he and the Earps had pursued was found dead, so warrants were issued for all of their arrests. They all had fled to Colorado, where Wyatt Earp was good friends with the governor. 
Earp managed to convince the governor of Colorado that the justice system in Arizona was corrupted by the allies of the dead man, so none of them, the Earps nor Doc Holliday, would get a fair trial. The governor of Colorado believed him and ignored the request for extradition back to Arizona. So the Earps and Holliday were safe in Colorado. But by this point, Holliday's tuberculosis had advanced so far that it little mattered if he were extradited, his days were numbered. In early 1887, he went up into the mountains west of Denver to the town of Glenwood Springs, where the hot baths had been used by natives as a place of healing for centuries. He availed himself of them, but his condition was too far gone. In his last days, he continued his correspondence with his beloved cousin, Maddie. Maddie had entered the convent in 1883, shortly after the shootout at the OK Corral. Some say she entered then because that was when she finally accepted that her beloved John Henry wasn't coming back to her. But regardless, she was now Sister Melanie Holliday, and the correspondence between her and Doc had never ceased. This relationship is actually referenced very poignantly in the film Tombstone. Doc Holliday, played by Val Kilmer, is on his deathbed. Wyatt Earp, played by Kurt Russell, is sitting next to him, and they're playing cards. Holliday, wheezing and coughing, says, I was in love once, my first cousin. She was, we were both so, she joined a convent over the affair. She was all I ever wanted. In these last days, Maddie's influence helped him to approach the local Catholic priest. Catholicism had come to Glenwood Springs just a few years earlier with St. Stephen's Parish established in 1885. So Father Edward Downey was in the area off and on. He wasn't permanently in residence, but he was able to respond to Doc's desire for a priest in his last days. And it was with the assistance, instruction, and sacraments administered by Father Downey that Doc Holliday died a Catholic on November 8, 1887. The legendary Wild West gambler and gunslinger was only 36 years old. The man, given only months to live after his diagnosis of tuberculosis, had lived for 14 amazing years. But this isn't the end of our story. First, to give a nod to the official record, there's no actual paper trail at St. Stephen or elsewhere in the church of Doc Holliday having become Catholic. But the records that people usually look for are baptismal records. But if he really had been baptized as a child, even as a Presbyterian, the priest in Colorado wouldn't have baptized him again. Christian baptism is Christian baptism. So who knows what official record would have been appropriate or considered necessary at the time in that place for that situation. The priest could have just recorded a Protestant became a Catholic. I heard his confession, gave him communion and administered the last rites. There's no particular form for that, really. No. And the lack of a Catholic funeral isn't proof against his having become Catholic either, because Father Downey was out of town on the day he actually died. The local Protestant minister presided over his burial, which was that afternoon, and it was done in the frigid temperatures in the frozen tundra of the high mountains of Colorado in November. The evidence that he became Catholic comes from the local paper, which reported his conversion, and they based their report on correspondence with his cousin Maddie. And that testimony is proof enough for us. The second extra bit of our story is the long-term impact of Doc Holliday and Maddie Holliday on American literary and cinematic history. Yes, as we said, Maddie was related to Doc through her father. Their fathers were brothers. Well, on her mother's side, Maddie was related to Margaret Mitchell, the author of the book Gone with the Wind. Mitchell's great-grandfather was the brother of Maddie's grandfather, making Maddie and Margaret Mitchell second cousins once removed. Not exactly close relations, great work on that tongue twister, by the way, but Margaret Mitchell, who was born in 1900, very often visited the hospital where Sister Melanie Holliday, that is, Maddie, served. Mitchell loved listening to the stories of the times gone by and was inspired by Sister Melanie's stories about Doc Holliday, so much so that when she wrote Gone with the Wind, she modeled heartthrob Ashley Wilkins and his first cousin, the lovely Melanie Hamilton, after Doc and Maddie. Well, Mitchell is finally able to do in fiction what could not happen in real life, bring Ashley and Melanie together. And since Gone with the Wind was first published in 1936, three years before Sister Melanie died in 1939, it is very likely that Sister Melanie, Maddie, was able to appreciate the tale of Ashley and Melanie's love. This also isn't the extent of the Catholic influence on Gone with the Wind, but that would be a story for another day. Yes, this one is long-winded enough. Yuck, yuck, yuck. <laughs> oh. 
And one final tidbit that we'll share before signing off, the name that Maddie took when she entered the convent suggests the deepest desires and struggles of Maddie's heart. Melanie is the English version of Melania. St. Melania was a 4th and 5th century Roman woman who married her first cousin at 14. After discovering that her husband was also her first cousin, even though she loved him, she took religious vows and lived the rest of her life in a convent. So that is, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story about Doc Holliday. A tragic story in a lot of ways, but in the end, true love saved him and brought him fully into the arms of the Lord. This has been American Catholic History. If you enjoy American Catholic History, please become a supporter. We've got great perks for supporters, including exclusive content, books, mugs, and personal conversations. Get information on how to become a supporter and the perks at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. Also on our website, sign up for our newsletter, learn more about Doc Holliday, see about our pilgrimages, and find other episodes that you might be interested in. We love getting your feedback and suggestions for episodes. You can email us at feedback at americancatholichistory.org, find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash americancatholichistory, on Instagram at ACH underscore podcast, or follow us on Twitter at ACH1513. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History, made possible by listeners like you. And that's the rest of, of the story. story. <laughs>